afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Disaster Preparedness Webinar. My name is Natasha Rinja, Deal Share Manager at ADPN, and I will be moderating the session today. Some reminders before we get started. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website. Each speaker will be, present, will be presenting for 10 minutes and we will take your questions after the presentations are done. Please feel free to use the console to type in your questions during the webinar and I will raise the questions to our speakers after. If you have further questions that are not answered by the end of the webinar, you can email us at dealshare at adpn.asia. We are very pleased to welcome our three speakers, Berger Stampadal, President and CEO of Gift to Asia, Justin Chang, Director Prudence Foundation, Robert Lapardy, Head of Partnerships and Resource Development, IFRC. Welcome and thank you for taking the time to participate in this webinar today. Before I pass the time over to our first speaker, I would like to start with an introduction and sharing on what ADPN has been doing through partnerships around disaster preparedness. Disasters affect a wide spectrum of the UN Sustainable Development Goals in the context of poverty, urbanization, and climate change. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction highlights the need to reduce disaster risk and build resilience. This interlinkage offers opportunities towards building disaster resilience in India, in Asia, which is the world's most disaster prone region. And these countries with the highest exposure to disaster risk are usually not equipped or have a low capacity to mitigate them. The Asia Pacific Disaster Report 2019 identified three key opportunities for impactful action towards strengthening disaster resilience in the region activating and leveraging on the potential of regional cooperation, driving policies and investments that addresses disaster risk reduction, and supporting innovative technologies that drive intelligent impact towards disaster resilience. This year, ADPN together with Prudence Foundation developed the Disaster Tech Innovation Program to build collaborative action for impact and to raise awareness crowdsource innovative solutions in disaster preparedness and support the efforts to create more viable technology solutions for disaster tech. One of the outcomes of this program was the convergence of practitioners and partners who were interested to further this discussion around disaster preparedness and we are nurturing this community by bringing together experts and industry leaders to collaborate, build awareness and share knowledge and resources. Today, we are very excited to hear from these three speakers as they share their experience around disaster preparedness, bringing in their perspectives on leveraging technology, involvement of communities, and some examples of their work. Without further ado, I will now, now hand over the time to Berger. Thank you, Natasha. Um, um, happy to be here speaking with everyone on this issue of disaster preparedness um, philanthropy. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a continuation of a discussion that started at AVPN's annual conference this, this year. And I'll give a quick overview of Give to Asia, um, talk about our um, um, uh, talk about our work in disaster uh, relief, recovery, and preparedness, and some of what we've learned through that work. Um, I'm going to also try to forward my slides here. I'm not sure if that function's working for me right now, Natasha. Berga, you should have uh, access to move your slides. Can you try again? Sure. There we go. Thank you. Um, so just very briefly on uh, Give to Asia. Um, we are a, a philanthropic uh, service uh, organization. We are a, a, a nonprofit registered in a couple of different countries, the United States and Hong Kong. 
Um, and we work with private philanthropy from uh, corporations to uh, families, foundations across a broad range of issues. Um, those include health, education, livelihood, um, as well as disaster. Um, and we work across 25 different locations in the Asia Pacific region. Um, China and uh, India are probably our two most active areas. And a lot of the work that we've done in disaster uh, uh, funding has been in, um, in, I guess, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and East Asia. So, uh, and I think specifically on the preparedness side, most of our work has been in Southeast Asia. I will see here if this is now still working. Uh, so, uh, I, I think I'll start by talking a little bit about our work in uh, locally led um, relief and recovery. Um, in the area of, um, of disaster recovery, we started doing work in 2004 after the, um, the tsunami in Southeast Asia. I actually began with the organization in 2006, um, and for the first couple of years that I was there, um, we were still doing quite a bit of work in long-term recovery and for a, a disaster of that size, even three or four years after afterward, it felt like um, the recovery work could have gone on for much longer. Um, since then, we've responded with funding to local organizations in response to over 50 natural uh, disaster events. And uh, last year we supported uh, programs uh, run by uh, local uh, relief organizations in India, Indonesia, Japan, and Taiwan. So we have a, a tendency to fund uh, not just the, the larger uh, natural disaster events, but also funding some of the, the smaller events that might fly under the radar of, of the international media, but still require attention and also have a good local um, uh, response organizations um, that need support. Um, over time, we found that local organizations are, are often better equipped to address the longer term recovery and preparedness. Um, but uh, these days, we're also seeing some um, national level organizations in quite a few countries in Asia that um, have quite a bit of capability in um, immediate relief work. And, and so we're we're now building um, partnerships with those organizations so that we can um, direct immediate funding uh, in the, 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 the hours and days after a disaster to support that local locally run um, effort. Um, however, um, you know, I think what one of the things that we've recognized is that disaster relief and recovery can often be very reactive. Um, I think there's a lot of data um, or a lot of different numbers out there about um, the payoff of spending on preparedness. Um, this number here that's on the current slide, uh, for every dollar spent on preparedness, you save $7 in relief and recovery, um, is I think an, a number that was published by the, uh, by the UN. I've also seen uh, you know, a $6 figure, a $4 figure, um, but I think that the general um, finding of a, of a lot, of the, uh, lot of the work done looking at preparedness is that um, it, it makes a lot of sense financially for communities to do work in preparedness and for philanthropy to be proactive in, in funding these in preparedness rather than being reactive for disaster. Um, I think one of the ch challenges that we've seen um, is um, funders um, in uh, private funds looking for measurable impact. And that's sometimes hard to get um, on the preparedness side. And also the motivation for disaster uh, uh, funding um, is often giving with the heart in a, the, the aftermath of, of a tragic event. Um, and funding for preparedness um, 
often requires sort of giving with a different kind of motivation. And so one of our challenges in this has been finding the funding community for preparedness that really sees the value. Um, and I think where we've seen most of our sex, success is actually in the um, aftermath of a disaster and putting forward preparedness um, programs as part of the recovery effort. Um, but that's not necessarily a great long-term solution for um, for organizations doing preparedness work because it doesn't provide a lot of steady thing for programs that not need to be ongoing. Uh, the work that we started doing in preparedness um, started in 2014, and um, we've um, been running a program since that time in South and Southeast Asia that has uh, focused on community-based organizations. I'm sorry, I, this looks like, uh, um, there we go, that's the slide. Um, so working with community-based organizations in, um, in eight countries. Uh, so we've built a network of about 150 CBOs in those countries um, and trying to build a community of practice so those organizations both um, learn from each other and also benefit from um, networking with the larger international community. Um, I think a lot of the solutions that we've been working with um, for longer term sustainable disaster preparedness have also um, engaged um, local government and uh, in some cases the for-profit sector, in some cases for the purposes of, of technology, which I think some of the other speakers on this panel will discuss. Um, and uh, I think the the looking ahead at what we're what we're planning on doing in the future, um, I think is is a, a continuing to expand that network on the eight countries that we're currently working in, um, and also um, going deeper in some of the places where we've seen success. I think we've been working in the last couple of years um, in Timor Leste, um, and one of the um, one of our successes there has been um, working with a group of um, local organizations, civil society uh, organizations that have formed a network now that's um, um, become quite active at the national level, talking about national level DRR policies and how um, the, um, the civil society sector can work more closely with the Timorese government, as well as with international agencies and INGOs um, to build a stronger preparedness program in, uh, in, the, in the whole country. Um, so we see that, that as a big success for the program, um, but we're also looking at ways to expand the local level preparedness work that we're doing um, into uh, areas in East Asia, and, and more areas in Southeast Asia. The countries that we're currently working in, uh, the eight countries include Banglad uh, Bangladesh, ne uh, Nepal, India, uh, Myanmar, Vietnam, Timor-Leste, Indonesia, and the Philippines. I think that's eight. Um, so that's a quick overview of, of the work that we're doing. It's not specifically technology focused. It's really focused on helping local communities and some of the more at-risk areas um, have uh, sustainable preparedness programs um, that can leverage international partnerships where possible and that help civil society in particular um, work more closely with the local governments um, around them and, and other kinds of partners. So with that, I'll stop and uh, hand things off to, um, to our next speaker, speaker Justin from uh, Prudence Foundation. Thank you, Barbara, for sharing about the work that uh, Give to Asia is doing. I will pass on the time to uh, Justin Chang from uh, Prudence Foundation. Thanks very much, Natasha. Um, thank you very much, Berger, and a very warm welcome to everybody. Um, very appreciate. Uh, we're taking the time to, to hear more about the work in disaster preparedness, um, as well as um, you know, the, the, the efforts that we've been trying to do here at Prudence Foundation 
um, in particular the newest initiative of ours, which is the Disaster Tech Innovation Program. Um, apologies, Natasha, I can't seem to see the, the slides anymore. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, great. Thank you. So um, I'll go through this rather quickly because I want I want to ensure that um, we have time for um, Justin Hensroth of Fieldsite to give some sharing um, on, on his experience and, and obviously his organisation. Um, but what what we want to do is quickly share the journey that Prudence Foundation has taken um, since since we started working disaster preparedness back in 2013. And, and I guess why we, we partner with AVPN and, and our other partners, such as Give to Asia and the IFRC, who are on, on this webinar. Um, so we'd like to share with you all more around that and give you an insight into the strategy um, and hopefully also allow you a chance to consider if you'd like to, uh, to join us on this mission, of course, to, to, to save and protect lives using technology from natural disasters. But very briefly, um, we can go through um, who we are, the Prudence Foundation. Uh, we are the community investment arm of Prudential in Asia. Prudential is a life insurance and asset management organization. Um, we commenced in 2012, the foundation was created by Prudential to be a unified strategic platform to really make impact in, in the region with our, um, our community, community investment work. Uh, our mission is to secure the future of Asian communities by enhancing education, health and safety. So under these areas is where we feel um, as an organisation we can hopefully have the greatest impact, really trying to leverage off Prudential's long-term commitment and our geographical scale. Uh, the Foundation is very much an impact and partnership focused organisation. Uh, we have a strong focus on partnership. Uh, since we commenced we really sought to ensure that all our programs had the involvement of the private sector, government and humanitarian because um, we believe that is really the only way in which we can together solve the complex social issues that are presented to us. Um, as an organisation, Prudence Foundation is regional. We, we invest across the region matching the footprint of Prudential where we are operating in 14 markets around Asia and we're ensur ensuring that we can really reach the communities that we operate in. But going into now why we look at disaster preparedness, the numbers, numbers speak for themselves. Um, quite simply, you know, given the threat of climate change, we fear that disasters will only um, incur uh, more damage and, and, and be more frequent. So back in 2012, actually, we decided to look at the situation regarding disasters and we identified that most of the resources that were being applied um, was generally straight after the actual disaster itself and this is immediate relief. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this and as Berger implied this is super important definitely from the private sector um, as it's really a powerful way to engage the decision makers to allocate resources to support those obviously severely affected by natural disasters. But we decided to investigate the work that could be done in preparedness as well as long-term recovery as Burgess stated, there is evidence out there that there's a greater return on investment. And, and overall, we feel it is better to empower and make communities more resilient to disasters to prevent lives being lost. And that is what commenced the journey of the Prudence Foundation into disaster preparedness. And we don't have enough time to go through it, but we focus on other programs such as Safe Steps and Safe Schools, which are programs that are focused on mass awareness education as well as capacity building. But what we chose to do was look at technology. Given its prevalence in society, we felt that technology could be a powerful tool to help protect and save lives from natural disasters. And this is why we decided to embark on the journey in partnership with AVPN to develop this program called the Disaster Tech Innovation Program early this year, and which um, culminated at the AVPN conference in June um, with a with a um, with the presentation of awards to the winners. I won't go through too much of this of this slide, but in short, we really wanted to aim um, to use technology to reduce the human and economic losses from natural disasters, ultimately making communities safer and more resilient. We felt that 
we needed a way to raise the awareness of technology that's out there, that's already in existence, being implemented or being developed. And we wanted to create a platform to showcase this. We also wanted to aim to build partnerships. Uh, we feel it's tremendously important that organizations are given the exposure to connect with innovators and funders and resource providers to help build and scale their solutions. And the program itself involved around a competition um, which, which um, sought to attract social purpose organizations to, to demonstrate and, 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 and and uh, apply for the, pr the, prize, the prize grants, um, a pool of 150,000 US dollars, as well as networking communities at the AVPN conference. So in June, we were very pleased to announce that the winner of the uh, competition, well, it was an organization called Fieldsite. And as I mentioned earlier, Justin uh, from Fieldsite is here with us. Um, sorry, the slide seems to be stuck. Yes, yeah, sorry. So the winner was Field Site, followed by um, Seismic AI, and then followed by um, Pet Panjana. Um, it's important to share that you know, field sites, tech solutions, which Justin will go into, um, is highly relevant given you know, the general threat we have of earthquakes and the unfortunate issues involved with building construction and reconstructions. We're also really pleased that what Justin presented has potentially scaled and adopted by many other organizations. So if anybody uh, on this webinar would like to find out more, please feel free to reach out to uh, the AVPN team or us here at Prudence Foundation as well as for the other two runner-up organizations. The last point I have to share is the importance of partners that were involved in this program, and those are shown on, on the right-hand side of this, of this slide. These organizations really generously provided um, their expertise to help us with reviewing and judging. Uh, Prudence Foundation was not involved in the decision-making on the winners. We left it to these experts, and without them, we really could not have achieved this. And you know, I'd like to thank Berger, who's on, the, on this webinar, who was actually uh, a judge in the final round. Um, and we were really pleased that we saw such interest and engagement from these organizations who really saw the value of technology and how it could save and protect lives from natural disasters. But without further ado, I'd like to invite Justin from Fieldsite um, to please uh, share his thoughts um, to, with, with obviously uh, all of us. Go ahead, Justin. Great, great. Thank you so much, Justin, and, and thanks everyone for the chance to talk here. Um, yeah, so uh, for those of you who aren't aware of Fieldsite, uh, so Fieldsite is a tech platform that we started in Nepal after the 2015 earthquakes. And we were really focused on this question of why, why so many buildings fell down um, across Nepal, over a million structures um, collapsed or were damaged in the earthquake. And and in the and in the sort of the after the post disaster reviews, what was sort of a very clear finding was that it was it was poor construction, um, poor adherence to code that was sort of a, uh, a running theme for why why there was so much infrastructure damage. Um, and so so field site was reg originally sort of developed as a way to improve the the reconstruction in Nepal. Um, it's a mobile app designed to. Uh, be able to be used by, by engineers, by government agents, by organizations working in the field so that they can capture um, key stages of, a, of the construction process um, and in particular capture the stages that are most relevant to, to resilience um, or, or, or seismic resistance. Um, and, and so we've been going for, for now four years and, and really focused on the, the question of, of how we can respond in Nepal. Uh, but when the disaster tech competition came around, it, it came at a, at a very interesting time for us where we were starting to look quite significantly at where, where there were other opportunities, um, uh, in particular how we could scale outward to other potentially post-disaster contexts, but also how we could move out of being just, a, just part of the response. Um, infrastructure, infrastructure processes are ongoing all the time, and building resilient infrastructure is sort of a key way that you can build overall community disaster resilience. 
Um, and so for this year, we've been focused on, on really scaling up um, and working in different contexts. And the disaster tech competition was sort of a, a really critical um, piece of how we conceptualize that. Um, in, as part of our participation, it helped us really clarify not just what our product was, but also sort of um, what it had to offer to sort of many different partners in different contexts. Um, the, the platform gave us a chance to really sort of speak to a, a lot of different people. And, and now at, after the competition, we've really been able to leverage, I mean, not only the prize money, but also a lot of those um, connections to, to continue to, to scale up. Um, over the past summer, we've, um, we've created new projects in, in four new countries. Um, we've started our first work on the African continent. Um, and here in Asia, we've started working more directly with, with government agencies. So in Myanmar and Bangladesh, um, we're actually working to embed the tool directly in um, ministries of health or ministries of public works um, to, to try and get them to be um, really focusing on resilience, quality construction, quality infrastructure as a key part of what they do. Hi, Justin. Justin Hemsworth, are you still there? Uh, yeah, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, perfect. Thank you for that sharing. And um, it's great to hear about all the updates that you have um, regarding field time. And just to, um, before we move on to Robert, just a reminder to all attendees that you can start sending through your questions um, and we will ask them at the end of all presentations. Uh, Robert, I'll hand the time over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Natasha, and uh, thanks very much for inviting uh, the Red Cross uh, to do this. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, congratulations to you, Justin, for uh, uh, winning the award. It sounds like your organization has been doing some really exciting work. Um, so I, I do not have a, uh, I do not have slides, so you will not see slides, uh, those of you that are uh, online. Um, I'm going to talk just quickly a little bit about uh, what the IFRC and the Red Cross movement does uh, related to building community resilience and preparedness. Uh, kind of this uh, before a disaster happens, what do we do to prepare? Uh, and then I'll also touch a little bit on the theme of technology, some of the things that the Red Cross movement does, uh, and, a, and a few thoughts on um, on what the meaning of this might be as far as pluses and minuses, what it really means for uh, disaster affected people or individuals. Um, so first maybe I'll just talk uh, very quickly, what, what is the IFRC? We are the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent um, Societies. Uh, we are basically the secretariat for 191 Red Cross and Red Crescent societies around the world. Uh, we were founded over about 150 years ago uh, in Europe uh, in response to uh, some battles that had happened there and some individuals had witnessed fallen soldiers on the battlefield and felt less of what side they were on um, that uh, should provide assistance to them uh, of their um, humanity, regardless of what side they were on. So, um, over the years, uh, uh, national societies have developed. So, we're almost every country in the world. Uh, in Asia and Pacific, uh, we have um, national societies in 38 uh, countries. I think the uh, the only one that is really kind of left uh, without a national society in Asia is Bhutan, and that is in the present, uh, um, currently being developed. So, so we have about 125,000 branches just in Asia, and over about 20 million volunteers, because volunteerism is a very big part of the Red Cross movement. Um, Red Cross societies do different things, blood banks, ambulance services, swimming lessons, all kinds of things. But really what ties us all together is disaster preparedness and response and the promotion of uh, humanitarian values. So that's things like um, neutrality, impartiality, et cetera. 
So anyway, that's a little bit about who we are. So we are very international, but at the same time, we are very local in most communities in the world. Um, so what do we do about building community resilience? Um, we feel very strongly that um, it really uh, has to come from the communities themselves. I saw uh, Berger's thing about local knowledge counts, and that is, uh, that is a strong belief of the Red Cross movement. It was really great to see that. Um, we use a framework globally called vulnerability and capacity assessments that basically all of our branches around the world use. And we use this to figure out what the disaster profile is locally. Every, every place is very different. For example, in Sumatra, um, it might be earthquakes or flooding. Uh, maybe in the Eastern Philippines, it would be typhoons or the spread of communicable disease. Uh, even in refugee camps uh, in Bangladesh, that it would be obvious what their, um, uh, their issues are refugees, but they themselves also face uh, potential natural disasters like cyclones or even risk of further displacement. Um, also, we look very closely at the capacities um, that, that exist in communities. We don't believe in just flying everything in. I mean, that is, we do that at times. We organize internationally in the Red Cross. We have a very complex mechanism um, that we've developed over the years for doing that, but by uh, you know, by far the best thing to do is for communities and their, you know, surrounding communities to help. I mean, who helps you if you've got a problem? It's your own family, it's your neighbors, it's people in your neighborhood. So looking at those capacities like, you know, medical staff or first responder skills, durable structures that might be in procedures that are already in place like coordination with authorities, um, looking at how well um, people understand early warning systems so they can get out of harm's way. So we look at that and then kind of build action plans around that at the community level. Um, of course, you might say, well, everybody can't do that. And that is always a challenge. So we go through processes and resources are always an issue, but we do um, try to prioritize and kind of depending upon a community, whether it's in you know, rural Kachin in Myanmar, or whether it's in downtown Tokyo, you know, we have to look at, you know, what are the resources and what they can do. So an example might be in Myanmar. Um, I visited a thing fairly recently in Labuta district, which is in Irrawaddy, kind of the place that was hit by Cyclone Nargis. Um, they didn't really have a great understanding of some of the early warning systems, which had been, um, being developed uh, more recently, um, as Myanmar has been developing. Uh, they didn't really have a good evacuation place. They had evacuated to a temple. Um, but they did have a lot of capacities, things um, like local police and teachers, active youth groups. Um, and they, they developed a set of actions. They were actually in the process of having to, to build a new school. So, um, it was the perfect timing in this community, for example, that they built a, they put a lot of resources into building a cement structure that was high enough up that it could withstand um, cyclonic uh, winds and it was high enough up to uh, get out of the way of the, um, the storm surge uh, that would come in during a cyclone. So, so anyway, that gives you a, a little bit of a taste of the kind of thing that we do through our vulnerability and capacities assessments and then follow up with, um, with actions. But another kind of point I, I like to make is, you know, it's fine to go through these processes for preparedness and things like that, but a, a lot of what we do and that we really advocate with governments and others, with businesses, whatever, is to address some of the underlying um, causes uh, that people do actually are not resilient to disaster. Um, and it can depend on the economic situation of a country, but things that really get the most vulnerable are things like poor health and nutrition to begin with, inadequate housing, living on marginal lands, um, access to basic services in, in remote areas, and then also uh, really trying to get at some of the most vulnerable communities like uh, migrant workers or others that kind of 
go under the radar or don't even seek services uh, when, when they're needed. Um, I can switch a little bit maybe to technology. Uh, Red Cross uses a lot of technology, um, especially during disaster. Uh, the use uh, that we use, as, as well as you know, most, organi uh, most organizations these days, moving towards biometrics, whether it's to register people for food distributions or, um, or different services. Uh, uh, we use it a lot for cash transfers. There's a major kind of movement over the last 10 years to give people uh, unconditional cash payments as opposed to give them things, give them cash, and then they decide what to spend it on. Because we found that people do actually spend it on, while, while the occasional person buys cigarettes and, and whiskey, most people use that to buy medicine, they use it to buy what's needed. And every, every family has different needs, but we do a lot of this cash transfer through mobile banking and other uh, means of technology. Um, it's not always appropriate, um, but it is. Uh, it tends to be uh, most useful. Another thing we really found is, is actually connecting the disaster affected people uh, because now most people, even in many remote areas, if everybody doesn't have a phone, there are people in communities that have phones. But it's giving people access to the internet, charging stations, Wi-Fi, that can actually not only connect them with their families and let them know they're well, but can actually get them into maybe their, their family member that's in the Gulf uh, with some kind of uh, money to help them, uh, or get out, be able to receive cash resources. So um, we also used it for disaster preparedness and mapping for risks like uh, like actually f figuring out where the floods will be, how high up they'll come in places where there are normally kind of river floods, storm surge estimates, uh, and there's a lot of things that can now be done through, uh, through mapping around that. We also have been using a lot of what's called forecast-based financing. So this really requires figuring out what the weather is going to be like, basically, when the storms will come and getting aid to people before the disaster comes. So they can actually use that. They can reinforce their house, perhaps. Um, they can uh, use the money to actually evacuate. Uh, they can find ways that they can actually do that. So that requires uh, a lot of preparedness beforehand, but it also requires um, really kind of that connection from the macro level to the last mile. Um, finally, I'll just kind of talk a little bit about some of the pitfalls of technology. Um, while uh, it is the way of the world and we have to find ways and there has huge potential, um, I think like anything new um, and any uh, new technology, whether it, it's uh, kind of communications technology over the years, um, a, a key phrase is always appropriate technology. So we have to kind of um, look at our enthusiasm uh, for things and make sure that we're not really uh, experimenting. And we need to make sure our ethics are good about, about that. Um, we also need to be careful we're not putting people in harm's way. For example, after the Pakistan floods in 2010, open source public mapping data kind of resulted in threats by certain belligerents in uh, in the area. So if you get that, that information out there, those that wish to do harm or that have other uh, ways um, uh, related to conflict and things like that, um, it, it is out there and can be used against people. So, so that needs to be thought about uh, very well. And then also um, there People actually are cons very concerned about data collected through biometrics uh, and, and sometimes won't even seek aid, especially if they're from marginalized groups and think it might be, uh, might be used against them. So, so we never even see those people if it's used. So really, some of the good practices that we think about are facilitating individual autonomy. If it does that, it's usually pretty good because it allows people to make their own des decisions after uh, after a disaster. Um, and we have to also be careful that it really satisfies the people that are disaster prone and not just the responders like Red Cross, that it's actually 
um, really uh, helping um, the the issues of uh, of a somebody affected by disaster. There have been some kind of standards around it. Um, there's one uh, done by the International Committee of the Red Cross. We have a data uh, protection handbook. Uh, the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative has something called Signal Code. So these kind of uh, ethics um, and principle documents about how to use it really are uh, coming online. And we also want to make sure we obtain meaningful consent from people um, that they actually know what they're getting into and that we, uh, we do ethical reviews um, on testing of new innovations. And while they're exciting, we do need to make sure we're being careful. So anyway, finally, just to kind of sum up, um, you know, helping to build on the existing capacities, whether they're traditional or societal, um, is really important. And I think a little bit like Berger was talking about at the beginning, uh, what they're doing in Timor, kind of connecting to the national level, uh, we found that we really have to connect with with government. Um, the Red Cross is actually what we call um, auxiliary to the government in most countries, but connecting to those local disaster response government um, facilities, but up to the region and the national level is is very very important. We can't really we can't work in isolation. We have to connect to all. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you very much, and uh, really appreciate. Um, uh, people listening to what we're doing. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. Um, we have, we're going to move on to the Q&A um, section and we seem to have a lot of questions. Uh, let me just uh, find one. Um, so this question is for Berga. Berga, there's a question here around how do you measure impact of uh, disaster preparedness and how do you communicate that impact to your supporter? Sure, um, and and I I think I, as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, I think measuring impact on responses is is is, is often easier. Um, I, as we're looking at the projects that we're doing specifically in the area of preparedness, uh, we're we're looking at the sustainability of the uh, the programs that are that are coming online as well as the growth in the capacity of the communities and though it's also very difficult to measure um, but i think for example with the timor uh leste example um the 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 formation of a network of a of, a, of a, a several dozen local organizations to um, have a national level discussion on disaster um, uh, uh, DRR uh, uh, policies is a is a win, uh, I think, um, for from at, at sort of a more of a macro level for that country. I think oftentimes in some of our other program work for disaster preparedness, we're looking at the success of one specific community um, and seeing, um, you know, from our starting point did we achieve the the planning or provide put in place um, resources for the local community to do what they have identified as as their plan or the needs for preparations for say a future uh, typhoon or earthquake um, and um, we've had a couple of situations where in the Philippines specifically where some of the work that the local community organizations that were funding um, were doing actually um, made them better prepared for uh, disasters that then did come um, in the form of uh, typhoons and they could look and see how they responded uh, in, in, the, in the more recent disaster versus uh, uh, in this case Typhoon Yolanda uh, that was part of the impetus for the programming to start. Uh, so it's a it's not a really clear answer, um, but I think that if you're if you're looking at um, the growth and the capacity of the local community, there are, there are ways to measure it. Thank you, Berga. Um, I have my next question for Justin from Prudence Foundation. Justin, um, in your experience, how can we use technology 
to effectively raise the profile of disasters which are strong in itself and don't get international coverage. Thanks, Natasha. Thank you for the question as well. Yeah, I, I think this is this is part of the observation that we had um, that, that there are a lot of you know communities out there affected by disasters which don't perhaps make the, make the headlines. Um, for example, you know slow onset disasters like drought um, and and various sort of disasters which aren't so um, you know immediately impactful have a huge impact on people's overall livelihoods. Um, secondly, you know, we through through our work in the region, um, you know, we, we do have the privilege of meeting so many fantastic organisations who are considering how to leverage off technology, and you know, seeking to to use it as a low cost form to to really make impact. Combining those aspects, and as I shared earlier, recognising the role that Prudence Foundation is trying to play. Um, is really trying to create platforms um, using our, you know, our, I guess our, our resources to, to, to raise the profile of these organisations who are dealing perhaps with, with, natu with natural hazards uh, that aren't perhaps as, as large of a scale. So, of course, firstly, the competition in this program was our first, is our first attempt to do this. Uh, secondly, one thing that we're trying to do is, is leverage off our social media and, and, the, and the power of communications. Um, if, if people um, are interested, you know, please feel free to check out uh, the foundation's Facebook page, uh, as well as um, you know the, the website that Natasha shared earlier, where we were trying to also leverage off, um, you know, how social media is really something that a lot of people are getting information on. Um, you know, we have a lot to improve on, and as we're looking to explore potentially launching this competition again next year. Um, that's something that we, we're trying to, to seek, um, I guess, enhance, enhance our focus on, which is um, you know, the use of media um, and social media in general. Um, but, you know, I guess the last thing to share is, and really how we, we came together with this program with AVPN, it's really, you know, trying to get yourself out there and speak to the right people and meeting the right people who can obviously hear about the work you're doing. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, if, if, the, if the mission and the values align, that can hopefully increase the profile of, of, of the work that you're doing. Ho hopefully that, that helps answer the question. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Um, uh, Robert, I yeah, have a question. Natasha, if I could just jump in. This is Bob. Uh, yeah. Just to kind of reinforce a little bit what Justin was saying, uh, it's quite interesting. Um, for example, the, uh, the hurricane that just hit the Bahamas uh, in the Caribbean, just the American Red Cross, one of our 191 uh, national societies has raised $40 million for that one disaster. And we are still struggling to get tens of thousands of dollars uh, for the drought in North Korea, which probably a lot of people don't even know anything about. Um, so th those really are, you know, the the differences in the kind of stuff that that media and technology affect it. But one thing that we found is on the social media, we really through social media, we really are able to target uh, communities, and there exist these communities online that have a an interest either because of their ethnic connection or religious connection or just interest in a place. Uh, we actually are able to start that dialogue and engage with uh, people that are interested in the small-scale disasters. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. No, thanks. Thanks, Robert, for that. And just building on uh, what you've just shared, there's a question here for you. Um, what are some inclusion approaches that you would recommend to policymakers to ensure that the poor and the most vulnerable groups are not excluded from benefits of investment? Uh, wow, that's a uh, that's a, a big question. Um, that is, uh, I mean, that is really a lot of uh, um, somewhat of what we do at uh, a kind of a macro level. For example, one thing that um, we push is for universal health care. So 
that is trying to address you know the one of the underlying causes of people not having resilience to disaster is their their poor health status and their ability to access those things so you know it's really getting um leaving no one behind uh is a big theme that the humanitarian community is talking about these days and that doesn't necessarily just mean in uh developing countries it really yeah, I think there's a greater recognition in the world, no matter where people are, there are vulnerable populations, um, and that trying to identify those people and make sure that those resources um, get there. I mean, it's it's primarily the responsibility, kind of of a of a government, to have things um, organized that way, and the way they approach that is quite different depending upon how their society and economy is. Um, set up, but ultimately those policy makers are the ones, and that's um, that's what we try to really push our things like universal um, health care, agricultural policies that that don't marginalize um, farmers and you know end up with just you know large multinationals controlling everything, but uh, that that really those uh, the poorest of the poor are not uh, not left behind. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. And we have um, time for just one question, um, and I'll open this up to all three of you. What would be the best way to engage private sector to be involved and to ensure that disaster risk reduction and prevention investment is a sustainable investment? Yeah. Justin, uh, do you want to... Sorry, very good. Yes, go ahead. Um, I, you know, one of the um, areas where I think um, private sector could, could play a role, I think, it, you know, this doesn't necessarily have to be large, you know, international corporations. It can also be more at the local level. But I think that the economic impact of a disaster um, is can, can be one of the, the biggest issues for long term recovery. Um, you know, I think a lot of the funding that we've done on the recovery side has really been around livelihood recovery or sort of economic recovery for a region. Um, and I think there's obviously a lot of um, upside to the private sector to pay a lot of attention to preparedness, even just from the perspective of their own bottom line as they're looking at the preparedness of the, the communities where they have business or where they have operations. Um, I, think I'm, I think I'm actually surprised a bit that more businesses haven't put preparedness as a priority, especially in, in, in certain areas of the Asia Pacific region where, where clearly there's a huge business upside for some investment in the space, um, just in terms of local community investment for communities where they, where they have you know, both both markets and, and operations. And I think if businesses could look at it from that perspective um, as a sort of investment, uh, long-term investment for themselves in some of these high-risk areas, um, we might see more funding flowing in for for that that kind of, you know, work, which as we've talked about on this call has, um, you know, you know, clearly there's, there's uh, an, an economic benefit for, you know, funding this this kind of work upfront instead of waiting for uh, an event to happen. Thanks, if Robert. I can add, if, sorry, if I can quickly add, um, yeah, just to build on what Berger shared, um, sort of like there's two, two, two points to share. One would be in terms of getting the private sector more involved with disaster preparedness um, efforts, I think as Berger mentioned earlier, the impact point is really the key. Um, there is that significant concern. So therefore, I think if any organization, and there's something that we look at here at the foundation, um, you know, is seeking to be funded uh, with their disaster preparedness or long-term recovery efforts, clearly a well thought through sustainable um, operation is really important to demonstrate. Um, and obviously a clear um, explanation on, on how they will measure impact which implies an, a really robust internal monitoring evaluation um, process and systems. Um, the, second, the second thought to share is 
obviously with with the, with the mass movement now and the, and the growing interest in climate change, uh, there is that linkage very much with disasters. So that's another angle as well as many private sector organisations are, you know, considering how they can potentially get in, you know, involved and support climate change efforts. There's a way to potentially link it as well to disaster preparedness. So there's just some thoughts to share. Great, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks to all. That is um, that is all the time that we have now. And if you have further questions that were not answered in this webinar, you can email us at dealshare at abpn.asia, and we will do our best to get back to you. Um, Berga, Justin, uh, Robert, thank you so much for your time, and thank you for sharing your perspectives um, on the work that your organization is doing in disaster preparedness. And Justin Hensworth, congratulations again, and thank you for sharing your story with us as well. We will post the webinar recording on our website. Please look out for it. Before we end, please be informed of the following avenues to continue your engagement around disaster preparedness, uh, the DealShare platform. So for ABPN members, if you want to find out more information about the organizations like FieldSite um, from the Disaster Tech Innovation Program, you can find more information on the DealShare platform. And for others, if you'd like to know more, please reach out to us. And as mentioned, we are working towards building a community around disaster preparedness. And if you have any resources, insights, and best practices and an interest to collaborate, please reach out to us. And uh, we will also be circulating a feedback form after the webinar, and you can indicate your interest to be part of this community. On that note, thank you again to all our